Okay, today I have the pleasure of introducing you and getting an extended conversation for myself with Victoria Lundy. Victoria is a really interesting person. She is the person that I know who is the most accomplished thereminist, which is, uh, that's an accomplishment of itself because it seems like a really hard instrument to play. Um, she's also a performing musician with a group called The Inactivists, and she's a solo artist doing like solo ambient work using the theremin as a primary instru instrument. So. With that, I let's say hi to Victoria. Hi, Victoria. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, chatting with me today. It's really appreciated. Um, let's start off. I just threw out a couple of things that you do, but why don't I have? Why don't we start off by having you express how you think of yourself? Well, um, I kind of tumbled into playing the theremin, um, and. I can get into that later, but um, I really only started to explore the theremin as a solo instrument a few couple of years ago, really. Um, I've been playing in some kind of ensemble or, no, or other pretty much since, since I started playing in the 90s, um, either a band or some kind of experimental group or something like that. And I, I kind of partially because of, of just of just, it was sort of time, and because I got involved with, strangely enough, the uh, Rocky Mountain Synth Group, I started realizing I could, you know, that, that I was actually in a position where I could start doing some of my own compositions and working on stuff on my own. So that's kind of where I am right now, and I, what my goal is, I guess, is to try to explore the whole idea of the theremin as an expressive electronic instrument um, in a way that maybe other instrument, other electronic instruments haven't traditionally been expressive because of its, just because of the interface, because the way you play it. Right. Um, do, what, what model theremin do you use? I have the great luck to have purchased an Etherwave Pro when mm -hmm. they started making them. Um, pretty much right after, actually I bought it, at, I purchased it at the factory um, because I was at a theremin, a theremin event in Asheville at Moog, and um, they were kind of the head of, they, they, they gave us a deal. And um, yeah, it was really, a, I don't think, I, I don't know that I would have, I probably would have tried to buy one, but that was really amazing. It was an amazing coincidence that I, that, and then they didn't, they only made, I don't know how many they made, but they didn't, they didn't, they were in production for very long. Right. And then they, they stopped making them. I think I have number 300. Oh, that's amazing. That's <laughs> astounding. What a yeah. great opportunity. Yeah. So um, that was my, that was my great luck. Um, I, and that is my gigging instrument. I, I still have my original black Big Briar theremin that I bought in the 90s from uh, the Bob, Mo Bob Moog's company then, which was Big Briar. Right. Um, which is a lovely instrument. It actually is quite good. Um, and I also have a Wavefront classic theremin, which is in a, in a, a cabinet. It's a really beautiful instrument, um, but it's not very practical or taking, yeah, it's, it's taking that anywhere. That's one of those that like it's it's the really fancy wood cabinets. It's right? got the legs and yeah, yeah I mean right. and it's just like yeah, I've, I've taken it in a couple of <clears throat> a couple of situations, but it's not it's not very good for that. And it's a little bit it's a little it's a little spooky. But this one just pops apart and goes in a bag. It's it's really absolutely designed for for traveling and, and taking somewhere and it has beautiful linearity and a great tone. It's a fantastic instrument. Interesting. So um, what instrument were you, what instrument did you play prior to the theremin? Well, you know, I'm not a, I am not a, a huge musician before the theremin. I played some guitar. I did like what a lot of people did. I played some guitar. I played a little bit of piano. Um, I was not a really seriously trained musician. Um, and I just sort of fell into the theremin. Um, I had a lot of, I have a very musical background when it comes to my family. My mother was a singer and she was a classical, a classical, you know, opera trained singer. So I was around a lot of music from the okay, beginning and I had sure. a lot of familiarity with it. And I, you know, I took piano lessons when I was a kid and et cetera, but I'd never really found anything or fell into the performance aspect in my life until I found the theremin. I really, I'm trained as a visual artist. I mean, that's kind of where I came from. Interesting. And the reason that I, um, 
even really found out about the theremin as an instrument, other than this, just this peculiar thing I'd heard, which I, I was really fond of, but didn't know how it was played, was because I was working as a volunteer at the Bug Theater back in the 90s, and uh, Jeff Cleveland, who's a tremendous jazz musician in town, came through with the emergency broadcast players, and he had a theremin. And he played that in the emergency broadcast players. I'd never <laughs> seen one. I had no idea what the interface was. I'd always kind of imagined it was some kind of keyboard. And I was hooked. I just had to have one. <laughs> that's interesting. That's that's cool. Now, I'm curious. You say that you had a, a very musical family and a lot of musical mm -hmm. influence when you grew up. Now, one of the things I would say is in talking with people, people who have parents who were musicians, who were serious mm -hmm. musicians, either are sort of like pushed into becoming musicians themselves or are like actively dissuaded from being musicians because it's kind of a hard way to do your thing, you know? I was probably, I was probably in the second category a little bit. I mean, it was sort of like, it wasn't exactly, I wasn't exactly dissuaded, but I was like, it was pretty intimidated maybe. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we all were a bit, I mean, all of, a lot of us are dabblers. I don't think any of us are, were, were real, you know, my brother had played in a band. Uh -huh. My other brother played occasionally and got into music, and he was actually a DJ for a while. And But, you know, I wasn't really performing. I never really performed except for, like, once when I was in my 20s until, like, the 90s. Um, and that was with the theremin, and that was just in a really, you know, strange, forgiving situation. I ended up playing with a, an experimental group, and, you know, I was the kid with the bat. I had a theremin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was really what it was. I mean, that's how I got started. So you saw Jeff Cleveland uh, playing playing with theremin, and you were like, "That." Did you say that looks like a fun instrument to play, or did you say that sounds like an instrument I would like well, to play? Or it, it was kind of a little then? both. It was it was partially what it was was that I had I was a fan of the theremin before uh -huh. I ever saw one, and okay. from just from just the uh, the point of view of like somebody who was really into like B movies from the fifties. Oh, that sure. Kind of okay. Yeah, All completely. Right. So I knew what it was. I knew what it sounded like, but I had no idea how it was played. Uh, so it was a whole, like it opened a complete, I had no idea. That's how you played a theremin. I had never actually seen somebody play one. Right. Anywhere. I don't know how I managed not to do that, but <laughs> I, I had never actually seen one played until then. And it was a real revelation that there, there was this really freaky interface to make these sounds I'd always kind of, I think I kind of in my head pictured something like an own Martineau or a, a Novacord or something. Right, you know? something that would have some, uh, that would be like a regular instrument, but with right, some, right. some tool to facilitate the slidiness. Right, right. Right. Exactly. So, so that was just fascinating. I thought, well, I've got to, I've got to try this. This seems like something that I could do. Cause I, I always, I always had pretty good pitch. Uh huh. So I felt like that was maybe something that would help. And, and like a lot of instruments, and I, I have I happen to think I'm kind of a slow learner, but you spend a lot of time really being really bad on the theremin before oh, you sure. can really get a grip on it. Sort of like right. playing the violin or something. Right. It's just that's, really yeah, that's when you said that, it was the immediate thing that came to mind. Violin sounds horrible right up until the moment it starts sounding good. Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot like that. I mean, you can kind of, there's, there's a lot of theremins on eBay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it just, it just you know you know eventually people just get tired of trying I think right. and before they make that breakthrough and sure. some people make it faster I mean they're you know that being said that I'm not like I don't have a huge musical background there are people now who are playing who are spectacular musicians I mean there always have been a few but it it kind of exploded in the last ten or so years I think a lot more classically trained. Musicians, people who were playing, you know, instruments in an orchestra who decided to take up the theremin. And right. their, you know, their learning curve is much faster, of course. And they're, you know, they're touring and doing you know, formal setting, classical and other types of concerts that I, you know, that were really up, you know, something you almost never saw before. Right. Except with a few people like Lydia Cabana, uh -huh. who was like, you know, but... But yeah, they're they're out there and they're they're doing. I mean, they're just everywhere now. I mean, to me, I'm sure it's a pretty small group of people, but it's it's amazing who's out there playing, playing the theremin as a legitimate instrument, not as a novelty. 
Right, right. Doing, not as, you know, not as a version of the musical saw. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, putting out new music, putting out recordings of, of compositions from the first wave of the theremin, you know, during the 30s and 40s right. that people, you know, there were some people who were composing for the theremin at that time. And those things, you know, they were played by Clara Rockmore and then you never heard them again. And now people are resurrecting them. There were people that became entranced by her and her particular style. And I think we're right. writing specifically for that, right? Right. I think so. Yeah. And, you know, some of them were just writing for this, you know, oh, this weird electronic instrument, I think. <laughs> but, you know, that, oh, here's this new thing we can, you know. But I think a lot of it was, it was kind of, it was kind of bracketed by what they heard her abilities and sure. her sound. Right, right. I think that might have influenced them. Right. So when you decided to... Or when you started doing this, you how did you get from a person who bought a theremin <laughs> because it was because you saw one played and you loved the sound from B movies into being part of an experiment being the thereminist for an experimental band? That seems like a pretty up. big leap. <laughs> yeah, did you really it's like well, I mean, was it like friends and they were like, Oh, you play something weird, come on and play. Well, I you know it you know, it, showing up is 90% everything, I think. Right, um, I, I, I really was kind of like that. I was, at the time, I was, uh, like I said, a pretty involved volunteer at the Bug Theater, and it was just completely, I mean, it was a much more out there experimental place than it is now. Um, it was, we were, it was really, you know, performance art, really out there. And there was a group that had formed um that was kind of a loose association called the Carbon Dioxide Orchestra that always featured somebody playing a big piece of metal with a big piece of dry ice right. and, you know, putting it through effects. And it was just really whack. And it was, it was actually almost a tradition at right. that point. But um, I was just kind of getting slightly comfortable in the instrument and was like, oh, you should, you should play a session with us. I mean, <laughs> that was, yeah, that was kind of how that happened. It, it really was sort of the kid with the bat thing, you know? Wow. There just wasn't a lot out there. And I was really determined to, uh, to, to try really hard and, and play it. And it was a very, it was sort of a, almost like a conduction group where mm -hmm. there was very little, it's mostly expert, you know, listening and, and in the moment type composition right. um, based on whatever was happening. So it was great ear training. Sure. No doubt. Ear training. Right. And challenging, but not not scary <laughs> in a way, because you know it was just so freeform that I could just kind of get comfortable, and I got oh, I got sure. comfortable pretty fast. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of wide open, so that gave you a lot of space. Right. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. So now, when you started doing it again, especially so so when was it that you started being kind of serious about playing? What what kind of time frame? Yeah, I fooled around a little bit. I was while I was doing that, I was trying to get control of the instrument as mm -hmm. an instrument, right. um, and so I just started. You know, I, I went through the. There is a there was at the time a very small book on how to play. It's written, I think, by. I think it might have been written by Claire Rockmore. There were a couple of videos on how to play that I think Lydia Cavanaugh had made for for Mo. So I went about just training myself, mm -hmm. um, and started getting some control over it and playing, um, trying to play linearly. Right. Um, and, you know, mostly there wasn't really the, the internet, thank God. I mean, the internet has made it so much easier. There was nobody teaching. There was right. nobody showing you how to do this. So you had to kind of work it out on your own. And um, I started to get a grip on how to control it. It took me a while because I, I was kind of a slow learner. Um, but within, you know, I, I think I started playing in like 96 okay. and within a couple of years I'd gotten, so I could at least, I could at least sketch a tune, you know, um, I wasn't as, you know, it wasn't great, but I could do it. So, and I got, I got, you know, I just kept working on it. I mean, I don't really have a, a solution for how I did it. I just sort of right. worked at it. So like who, who would have been influences? Because at that time there wouldn't, other than like these classes, classicalists mm -hmm. yeah there didn't seem to be a lot of people using it as a as an adventurous instrument right 
And right. so did you did you find yourself taking influences from other musicians or was it f in taking influences from the people you played with and just finding a way to fit in? How did you how did you like mold your your sound or your voice on the instrument? Well, there's a couple of things. One of it was somebody who was pretty influential early on because she, she was, you know, besides Lydia Cabinet, who was sort of the classical thereminist at the time, you know, and she still is. Um, she's the, I think, grandniece of theremin. He taught her how to play. Oh, she's okay. Kind right, of, right. She's kind of, um, there was Pamela Kirsten, who I know she's been remarried and I know she has a new surname, but I can't remember what it is right now, who was also, uh, um, who is and was, um, a, a thereminist from that period who was extraordinary and had a completely different sound than I could ever have. It, she mm -hmm. just, her, her, everybody's approach is so transparent. You can, you can hear them like in a couple of notes, you can almost tell who's playing. Oh, sure. I almost can like a guitarist or something because it's just such a transparent interface. So she has this delicate touch I've never had. Uh -huh. Um, and you know, Pam, and, and, and so there were a couple of people who were actual thereminists at the time who I was trying to emulate, but I really took my cue from vocal music, oh, uh, sure. classical vocal music. Um, and there's, a, you know, my mother was a singer. Right. Um, I had heard a, a spinto soprano who sang a lot of Puccini for most of my life. And mm -hmm. I had learned, learned those scores and that was where I went. I went to that and that's what I tried to learn. That's where I, you know, those were the things that I used as my benchmarks. Wow. Well, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty serious. That's, that's, that's well, jump, jumping into the deep water a little bit. It really was, but I, I kind of felt, I understood that music in this kind of visceral way that I think sure. that I, that, that you, you know, that you do when you're exposed to it all right. the time. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And I knew it. <laughs> so what are what are the things that you hear then that you hear yourself doing that you don't hear other thereminists doing in their work? You know, because I would say it's it's interesting you said that because um, I got a chance to see you when you performed at the older Dairy Center for the Arts, mm -hmm. and it was extraordinary first of all, but also the the tone and you know I had. For some reason, when I uh, when I went back to school, um, I kind of found myself getting a little bit pummeled with Clara Rockmore stuff, right? Uh-huh. It was kind of interesting. There was, like, this guy who was teaching who was really into it, into the theremin, <laughs> and particularly into her uh, work on the theremin. And so I got a lot of it. I got to hear a lot of it. And I always found it to be, like, very, like, hyper-romantic and very violin-y. Right. Yes. And in which your makes case, some sense because that was her instrument. Oh, she was okay. a violinist. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that would make sense. But yeah. when you said that you got your influence from vocal music, that immediately clicked because your stuff, your playing doesn't remind me of a violin. It reminds me of a singer. And oh, okay. so it's very interesting that that was your influence. Now, what what do you think are the details that make that come out? Um, I think the thing is that, see, the theremin is this interesting thing in that it doesn't, well, you know, it has a lot of things that are like, well, that are like vocal music and are not like vocal music. But part of it is, I think that the thing that is, is unique about the theremin, or at least kind of like makes it more of an electronic instrument, is that you could play a note for 30 minutes without taking a breath if you wanted right, to. Right, They're Just holding your hands in position and just standing there. You mm -hmm. drone for the rest of your life. But I, I've always thought of the phrasing of, of music, especially if, if, for instance, I am trying to play an aria, which I do a lot um, on my own especially. It's all about breath. Right. I, I think of phrasing as breath. And I think the one thing that I, I do if I bring anything unique to it is that I tend to phrase like a singer. Interesting. Um, and I tend to use the idea of breath sure. in my phrasing. I, not always. I, sometimes I consciously don't do that when I'm doing certain things. Um, but I, I think I think about it that way. Sure. 
do you find yourself like singing along with yourself as you play or you have to really sub vocalize mental... the play <laughs> yeah right okay you kind of do i mean yeah. i i hear people who can actually do this i think peter pringles one of them or a couple of people i've heard do this who can actually sing and play the theorem at the same time i do not know how they do that oh that seems i i have yeah. never really been able to do that i can do a little bit like i can hold a note and i can sing a phrase over it but uh -huh. i can't do what I've heard people because I am sub vocalizing those damn notes right. to myself all the time. Sure, interesting. Yeah. So um, the, let's talk a little bit about the instrument itself because you meant you mentioned something before about um, one of the instruments that you have having like a peculiarly good linearity and stuff like that. For people who aren't familiar with the theremin. Um, there's like an antenna to one side and a vertical antenna. And I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous because I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> it's going to sound like I'm making a joke, but you play it by waving your arms around, which is sort of a, yeah, that's right. But it's, I think it's at the heart of why it ends up really quickly, either be, being like disappointing or incredibly personal because the way that you move is going to have a direct correlation with the instrument. Now, yeah. uh, with the sound that you make. Now, my mm -hmm. question is, what are some of the differences between instruments and what would make an instrument preferable, one instrument preferable over another to you? Well, the most of, there are a couple of things that are just paramount. And one of them is just kind of its inherent tone, which I know you can manipulate with effects and, you know, things you put in the, in the chain after the tone that comes out of the actual instrument. Right. But, um, like I say, my gating theorem is my favorite theorem for a couple of reasons. There's, it's got a beautiful kind of basic tone, and you can manipulate that by adding more of a saw wave or less of one or more of a just a sine wave style. You know, it has a couple of presets okay. to give it a more rough or a less, you know, a smoother kind of sound or more of a flute sound, more of a, a rougher or a rougher sound. Sure. So I think the inherent tone is, inc is important. Um, the cabinet theorem I have has a beautiful inherent tone that's very much like a cello. Um, sure. It's really, you know, it kind of, it's sort of funny that it looks like a, it looks like a grand piano <laughs> in terms of a theremin. <laughs> and, and it, it sort sounds of sounds like, like one, you know, it sounds like this. <laughs> right. uh, it has a beautiful, beautiful inherent tone. But the thing that is, to me, the most important thing, because you can kind of manipulate that with um, post effects. Right. is linearity and that is the scale between the lowest note and the highest note on the on the theremin which is going to be controlled by your right hand antenna the, the upright antenna okay. um, is sort of a logarithmic relationship as you get closer to that antenna the the notes are going to get closer together as they get higher they're going to get closer together as they're lower they're going to get a little farther apart so it's almost a logarithmic kind of thing and the best theremin's smooth that out and make the the linearity is better it's more of a you know like just a straight scale it is never an exactly straight scale it's always going to be smaller the higher notes are going to be a little smaller right farther closer together in the learner but the better the linearity the more playable the instrument's going to be oh that would make sense because you just get used to jumps in distance representing mm -hmm. notes and if that's constantly changing that has to be a little disconcerting right. and even if you know and there's going to also be a limit to your high notes if uh -huh. they're too close together right, too far right. apart you're going to have harder times doing i mean there's going to be some physical physical limitations right at some point with so i find that the linearity is is something to and it takes a little while to kind of get get a feel for that linearity but i've gotten so i can like walk up to an instrument and kind of tune it up and kind of get a feel for where those octaves are right very quickly and kind of see if it's going to be a, how playable it is. But that's, that's, I think that's the most important thing. Interesting. Now, does, does uh, your environment have much to do with how the instrument responds? I, and I ask this because, I mean, first of all, we are up in the Rockies, and so we have this really dry, arid, uh, but constantly changing uh, weather, weather environment, right? And mm -hmm. I know for, uh, like, in synth world, the playability of certain kinds of touch-based uh, instrument interfaces 
become really difficult in really dry weather. And mm. as a, and also as a guitarist, I know guitars respond really differently and really weirdly to some of the weather that we have here. What do you ever see that? I mean, because it's a no touch device, but also because it's really weird electronics. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if it has, if there's any, if the, this kind of environment has any effect on it. Part of it, I have to say, there are so many other things that are affecting you before you even get to that point. <laughs> okay. That you kind of, I don't even, that's almost becomes negligible. I um, see. It's sort of, okay, you have to realize a lot of the, I have played the theremin in crowded bars full of drunk people. Right. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> what you're constantly <laughs> doing, oh, it's, that's huge. Um, you're constantly trying to figure out how you can isolate yourself physically right. from the rest of the room or from anything that's moving, first of all. I mean, it's kind of the lowest level of defense is trying to keep especially your pitch antenna because the pitch antenna is affected by not just you. It just It's affected by whatever is closest to the pitch antenna. And how far, how far, does, that, how far does that reach out? It can reach out. Depending on how you have it tuned, it can reach out for like six feet. Oh my goodness! Um, it really, yeah, it can be really, really devastating. And uh, I tune them pretty tightly, you know. And there's a limit to how how much you can do. And I've been on a tiny stage and tuned my theremin very tightly, and been yeah, it's been a little little dicey. But um, you know, the 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 real. You're you're getting affected by that. You're getting affected by stationary objects, too, because you have to kind of t like you know you have a big amp to your left or to right. your right. You're going to have to tune to that, right. and it's not going to move. So once you've got that set up, you're okay. And then um, you know you do you want to be to the for me. I want to be to the right of everybody on the stage because I want my pitch antenna as far away from swinging headstocks and drummers and stuff drummers, as possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, because that all having a guy back into you is going to just totally destroy what you're playing. So <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't even really thought about that. But yeah, yeah. The, all of a sudden the 300 pound drunken lout representing the uh, most musical thing near the stage is a little scary. Yeah, a bit. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, it's sort of like, how do you, how, it's, it's, it's sort of just kind of a damage control thing. And, right. and when you're really, lucky and you're on a big enough stage you're way over away from everybody and everything is lovely and uh that that's great but yeah it's sort of like the other the other aspects of how does the the weather or the you know ambient humidity yeah, it's like right. boy it's, yeah. it becomes it becomes if, if that was all you had to worry about right exactly I, I have had a problem where i played outside and it got hot and i my pitch kept um I had to keep adjusting my pitch between songs. Oh, interesting. Um, sure. Because I think the electronics were getting really warm. Right. <laughs> I had to say, right. okay, I'm at the edge. I got to stop. You got to stop. Cool off. Sure. So um, let's let's talk then a little bit about playing in a band because that's that actually sounds. I, I hadn't even really thought about how difficult that must be, but also where do you find the theremin slotting into kind of a band environment? Is it like I mean, what would be an analog instrument-wise? I mean, is it like being the saxophonist or the harmonica player where, you know, everyone plays and then they look at you and it's like, solo time? Or is there a way for you to play, like, backing, uh, you know, use, I, don't, I don't understand how it would fit in a band because I think well, of it primarily as a soloing instrument. Right. And one of the things that I've been doing since the beginning, and I've actually made a point of, is I really want to play as an ensemble instrument. I've tried to back, I mean, I've done solo work recently, but I've spent most of my time playing in ensembles. Uh -huh. Because I think that the theremin's a really cool instrument to have in an ensemble. And um, it fills a lot of the sonic space of a synthesizer, which you can imagine. Right. Um, of a keyboard, but you know, it's a monophonic instrument essentially. Mm -hmm. It's one note. So it doesn't have the attack of a horn. So uh, it doesn't really, it, it's kind of its own thing, but I feel like it's sort of, uh, I feel like it fills the space of a string instrument, like a cello oh, sure. or right. a violin or a vocalist, or as I said, it's kind of a synthesizer, but sort of like a monophonic synth. Right. That doesn't have any real attack, you know. Yeah, yeah. So 
um, that's kind of what I've always done. And I've always just found a spot. <laughs> well, I was lucky enough to hook up with a bunch of guys who, you know, heard the theremin, heard that I played the theremin, and said, yes, we must have this on every <laughs> song. Um, cool. And right. I'm not going to vouch for whether that was a good decision or not, but there it is. Um, and, you know, that was the inactivist. And I've been playing with them. You know, we've made six or seven CDs, and it just never ends, right? right. Um, <laughs> we've been playing together since, like, late 2003. So, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, there are solo moments, but a lot of it is just sort of these sweeps and whooshes that you would hear or these melody lines that you would hear a synth play. Right. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. And I've always liked the idea of it as an ensemble instrument because I think it does, it does kind of like, Oh look, we're going to try out the theremin. Wasn't that right. interesting? Okay. Now we're done. Yeah. Well, I it's, you know, I, I was hoping that you were, you okay. know, you, we could talk about it that way because you know, I always think of like harmonica players, very few harmonica okay. players know how to vamp or know how to, sit in an ensemble setting most it's times right. they're yeah they're soloing 100 percent of the time mm -hmm. which is kind of a tough sled and i was wondering if that was sort of the expectation of what a theremist would bring to the theremist would bring to the table and it's good to hear that you're finding a different place for it that's neat i i've always done that i've always and you know every time i i always try to i love to play an ensemble i like to play as a i sometimes i play as a drone instrument sometimes mm -hmm. i play as a you know, I play a melodic line, but I kind of think of it as the spot that maybe a background singer would, or a backup singer would, right. would have, or sure. maybe a, a keyboard player, or maybe a, a violinist or a, a cellist or something. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Now, um, speaking about ensembles, one of the things you've been doing recently is working with one of these conduction ensembles, right? Yep. Cool. Yeah. The uh, Flux conduction flux crew said con yeah, conduction ensemble yeah how how is that that's that seems like hard work to me it is hard work there are some electronic like guitar electronic electric guitars a uh, keyboard and me i think that's all the electronic instruments and then the rest of it is uh the rest of the ensemble is classical or acoustic instruments mm -hmm. uh, double bass cello um stringed instrument from vietnam which i can't remember the name of right now and um uh, some some woodwind lots of woodwinds some different different um some different you know some horns so so it's in a drummer so it's a it's a pretty eclectic group um and i've worked really hard to find different sounds to kind of get past the limitations of the theremin right. and come up with different kinds of of sounds I can do on command based on the conductor um, that will um, where I can come up with a percussive tone I can come up with some harmonics and I have to be able to do this pretty quickly so I've had to come up with different little you know pedal effects or whatever and things that I could do on the spur of a moment and sure. be able to 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 uh, to deliver immediately right and that's been a real challenge it's been hard work but i think we are going to finally play in in public so oh, cool. <laughs> it's going to be interesting who's who's leading this group um oh yeah uh dino dean uh oh. he's he uh he's leading the group and he's using butch morris's method of conduction right. he worked with butch for years mm -hmm. and um he's actually teaching a workshop um on, on sound conduction at uh, the King Center at the Media Music Festival during the day uh, of the, it's the 29th of April, during right. the day, um, and then at night we're going to have a concert uh, using conduction, the conduction group. So it's our, it's our, it's not quite our public debut. We've had a few people listen in, but we haven't actually played in this setting before. So nice. it's going to be interesting. <laughs> well, good luck. That sounds, that sounds like an incredible. It is challenging. It is like, by, by the time you leave a, a session, you're just wiped out. Oh yeah. It's very, very, you concentrate so hard for so long. Well, everyone I've talked to that's been involved in conduction uh, groups talks about like the level of commitment it takes to really, to really succeed because you end up having to spend a lot of time developing techniques that you can pull up at the drop of a hat, 
right? Exactly. And so as a result, you really need to be on top of your game and the, the level of concentration is extraordinary. I think, yeah, that's exactly right. It took me a few tries to get a, a suite of, of, of effects and et cetera that would work in this setting. Right. And it's sort of funny because I went back to my most basic analog stuff um, instead of doing anything. It's very, you know, I'm using um, an old digital effects processor and some Moger Fogers <laughs> for my post effects. I mean, you right. know, so it's yeah. like really and not doing anything with anything. It's just, it's all just, you know, kick it on. You're there. You're, you know, got your effect. Sure. Um, and it's really straightforward. So, now, have, have you ever experimented with uh, the theremin driving MIDI devices at all? Yeah, I have. Um, I've actually used it to drive um, some uh, MIDI uh, effects on Ableton. And mm -hmm. I've also used it to, um, strangely enough, to drive... I use control voltage because I have control voltage out in uh, pitch and volume okay. on this on the on my gigging theremin right. to drive um, to drive uh, effects on a slim fatty, which is oh, really interesting. interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah, a really nice. I mean, you can get some fantastic sounds out of that, and it really opens up the palette. Yeah, I was going to say that's a very that's a much broader range of tools than you're going to have as the direct output of the theremin. Yeah, it's you know. Again, with the vocal music, it's a, it's one note. It's a monophonic instrument in its right. heart. And I've also done some things with digital effects where I've used it to drive um, Native Instruments Reactor, uh -huh. which has been a really a really cool um, opening up of of things for doing sort of a um, a solo set or something where I'm doing sort of an ambient set. Sure. And kind of adding all these colors that are happening kind of spontaneously, being driven by the sound of the theremin. Right. Now, recently, recently you put out a solo album. Uh, it's called Miss America Vampire, I think, right? Yes, Miss American Vampire. Yes. Yeah. Um, what are, What was that like? How did you How did you build a solo album? Did you use a lot of other instrumentation, or was it just using the the theremin, or was it or did you have other artists working with you? What what was the process of making that? It was difficult. I, I haven't really done that before, so I think I made a lot of elementary mistakes. But okay. um, what I what I think I did, well, I guess what I would say is I, I went ahead and kind of stuck to the whole digital realm and did things using, like I said, I mostly used Ableton to build stuff, using MIDI devices um, for as sort of, you know, for for the things that I didn't think the theremin would do, right? Like you know, percussive things, and but then I got a little deeper into that and started sampling theremin mm -hmm. and made instruments out of them, right? Um, so I kind of I kind of cheated in terms of the theremin. I tried to bring the theremin in to do things that it didn't typically do, well, and then used it as its lead instrument. Essentially. Sure, that explains it though, because when I listened to it, when I listened to some of the tracks of it, there were clearly things that totally sounded like a theremin but didn't play like a theremin right and so that's why i was like i was a little bit confused about what you know what was going on there and now that makes sense if you use theremin as a source for a sampling instrument that would give you that essence of theremin while still allowing you some different playing functions exactly interesting and I want to go back and do more of that because I thought it was that was the most successful thing I felt. Sure. Well, it was. A, I thought it was a really successful uh, piece of work. I really enjoyed the sound of it. And again, it was it to me. It very much had a unique voice, which I think is cool because I think that the theremin is an instrument because of how you play it. It sort of forces you to develop your own voice anyway. I think but, absolutely. But yeah. somehow in that thing, you encapsulated you encapsulated your voice in the release, and I thought it was really successful. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. I want to do more. I, I I have to decide. I have to decide which way to go. I'm I've been thinking about that really hard for a couple of months about right. what what to do next. And I did. I think that was one of our. I think just finding the idea of of taking the theremin and making it into other things. 
was pretty successful, but I always liked the, the, the pure voice of it right. in, in the mix. Sure, certainly. Um, so before we go, one of the things I want to do is, uh, is maybe help those people that uh, buy a theremin and are already thinking about putting it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> In, in that I would I'm wondering how what you think would be ways that people could um, kind of rapidly approach the instrument that has a high level likelihood of success I think well and this was my approach that's so I'm very biased I thought thinking of it as a vocal instrument worked really well and trying to learn it um, and that's just because it's the way you play it is kind of inherently like singing in that you don't have it it's monophonic and you're doing it by just moving but it's not it it doesn't have any kind of fretboard or anything there's no there's no uh point of reference for you so i think the first thing i would do if i was going to start from scratch was i would first learn as carefully as i could given the documentation you give it the thing how to tune it and where to sit and I would sit down. That's the first thing I would do <laughs> because that helps you. It really helps. It's ridiculous how much it helps. And I would concentrate. It, it's a very Zen experience. I would concentrate on, on being still and learning how to go from stillness to movement with the theremin in terms of thinking about that, that antenna as your, the, the, the distance between your shoulder and that, that, that antenna as your pitch. That's extremely important, but the thing that I think that people neglect when they're playing the theremin and when they're learning is the left hand, which is your volume. Right. That, the, that's your articulation, and it's the most, it's very important. It's so important, and you don't start realizing how important it is until later, but if you kind of come in with that idea that, you know, you're making notes with your right hand, but you're I mean, you're making tones with your right hand, but you're making notes with your left hand. Right, sure. And that's how you articulate those notes, and that's that's as important and maybe almost more important than the other hand. And I think that it's neglected when people are trying to learn. But I think it's um, it, I think you have to kind of come at it from a very Zen point of view. Really, very. Uh, it's a, it's not a, it's not an instrument where you, it, you know, you're not playing the guitar and jumping in the air. <laughs> you're being really, really still, and um, and that, that's kind of this. It's sort of a, it's almost sort of like a yoga exercise. At right. Least. So I think, I think if I'd known that, I would have, I would have had a, a better, uh, I would have been better at the beginning. I would have had a better grasp of what, how to do this. So is there like a certain level of stamina that you have to develop just to hold your hands in place in space properly? My biggest thing is just standing that still that long. Um, oh, sure. um, literally. I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of, you know, especially if I'm playing with a band and I'm standing up, which I almost always do. I mean, sometimes after a set, I just, my knees are locked. I just, right. <laughs> I just ow, right. I can't, can't walk. So, so it's, it's more just concentration. It's that concentration. It's sort of funny people, theremins talk to each other about the theremin trance. Right. It's just this sort of like, look like you're in some kind of a fugue or something <laughs> while you're playing. And it is just that sort of depth of, you're listening really, really hard and you're concentrating really hard. Oh, the other tip I would say, and this is something I do, which most people know to, uh, comment on, and that is keep your amp right in your face if you possibly can. Keep it as close to your ears as you can with comfort or you know, put it behind you if you're playing a rock band. Make it so it's the distance between the sound coming out of that amp in your ears is as close as it can be practically because that is what you got to work with. You have to oh, be able your, to... Your feedback circuit, right. That is course. your feedback circuit. And you've got to be able to correct that very quickly. And a lot of the correction you do is these little microtonal corrections as the note's coming up. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, you can't play with your amp backlined somewhere. It's right. going to be really hard. Sure. Oh, that's That's great advice. Um, so before we go, let's, uh, first of all, who are some, uh, theremists, theremists besides yourself that you would recommend people listen to if they want to hear more? Oh boy. There's, there's actually uh, one of my, my favorites right now, who is a classical thereminist who's kind of taking the world by storm and just, uh, he's just released a, an album with a harp player is named Thorvald Jorgensen. Um, he's from the Netherlands. He was a classical musician. 
and he is extraordinary, a uh, classical theremin player, just amazing. Um, he's got a website. He's like I say, he's releasing a a new CD for harp, harp and uh, I think it's called duos, harp and theremin. Okay. He's amazing. Um, there's a for some reason the Netherlands seems to be full. There's another. Uh, fellow does really interesting experimental work called uh, Wilco Bottomans, who's a, an experimental thereminist. If you want to hear another really tremendously good thereminist, there's uh, Armin Ra, is a thereminist and performance artist who's extraordinary. Has done. There's there was a um, a documentary released I think last year about Armin Ra about the kind of journey with the theremin and it's it's really cool um boy they're just they're they're kind of everywhere right now i mean mm -hmm. you can you can look around but those are the those are the ones that come to mind right away sure and for people who want to hear more of your work uh and want to experience it uh where would you have them go uh they, i have a website it's um victorialundymusic.com okay and um, that's pretty much where everything I'm doing is posted at some point or another. You know, shows, my links to, to my music. Um, you know, if you want to hear my goofy, angry nerd rock music with the inactivists, you can go to inactivistsplural.com. Um, and, you know, we have tons of, of obnoxious, hilarious, irreverent. Fun. Yeah. Fun, I guess. <laughs> Fun for me. I thought, of it, yeah, I, I have a good time. I always have a good time. They're 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 just totally whacked out. Right. Our our lead our lead singer and primary composer is a, a crazy genius, and you know they all are. They're tremendous musicians. So I I really enjoy playing with them. Cool. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. All right. Well, Victoria, thank you again for your time and and for. Uh, chatting with us and kind of filling us in on, on some of the details about the theremin. I think it was really informative and uh, interesting for me since I, I mean, my one, every time I step in front of one, I just embarrass myself. So it's really, <laughs> first of all, good to talk to somebody who's really skilled with it. And secondly, to hear that, uh, you know, to hear about some of the details that would have passed me by. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, and with that, I'll bid you a good day. Bye now. Arg, problems with the microphone again. Yeah, this thing has got to go. In any case, uh, I want to thank Victoria for another great interview. Um, it was really great to learn a lot of things about Theremin, things I hadn't even really considered about using it as, a, as an interface and as an instrument. I want to also thank you for tuning in again, listening, for sharing this with your friends. It's been a fantastic uh, ride for me so far, and I expect to take it a long ways into the future. So with that, I'll leave you alone for the rest of the week. I'll catch you next weekend. Bye.